Hello. Welcome to Computer Science 4300. Man, it feels like forever since I've lectured in the courses for some reason. Um, how's everyone doing? Today, we're going to be talking about cameras and views. Not cameras, as the course schedule would have you believe, but cameras and views for our games, which will be an important part of Assignment 4. Today's lecture, I'm going to be going over... Um, some PowerPoint slides, and I, we're also going to be watching a couple of YouTube videos. So I don't really like watching YouTube videos during a lecture um, on Twitch, but as long as you go like subscribe to their channel, I won't feel so bad, right? Um, just <laughs> we're not taking many views from their pages, but we're going to be watching uh, two YouTube videos totaling about um, 14 minutes of the lecture because no matter how much I tried, I cannot do a better job of those guys than uh, actually... I can't recreate their content in the slides. It's just their video production quality is too high. So, uh, yeah, let's just jump straight into it. So today we're going to be talking about game cameras and game views and how we can accomplish those things in 2D games, at least, for SFML or within SFML. So let's jump into the PowerPoint. Okay, so lecture 13, we are flying along in the course. I think we're more than halfway done now officially. So let's talk about game cameras and views. So visualizing games. Video game worlds are often much bigger than we can display on screen at once, right? So think about it. Just like the real world, we have this possibly massive video game world and we can only display a subsection of the world at a given time. Like right now, I'm sitting here at my desk, I can see my monitors, I can see my keyboard and the microphone and the camera, but not a lot else. But a lot of stuff in the universe exists, believe it or not, outside what you can currently see. And so your eyes are sort of your camera um, that can look at the real world, and you can only see a subsection of that world. And just like um, in the real world, we're going to have that in games as well. So the part of the game world that you can currently see is called a view. So just like in the real world, you have a view of the environment. That view may be occluded by something. It might have a certain angle. It might be looking down. It might be looking up. Uh, in a game world, we can have different views as well. To mathematically describe the desired view of the game, we can use the concept of an in-game camera. So of course, in the real world, if we want to take a picture of something, right, we use a camera. So don't need to explain what a camera is. But what it does is it takes whatever universe we're living in, whether that's a 2D world or a 3D world, and it's going to take a picture of that. So in our 3D normal universe, we're going to take a picture using a camera, and that picture is going to be a 2D representation of what I can see from the camera lens, depending on things like the focal length of the lens. So intuitively, we define the location of a camera in the world and where it points to. So if I want to, say, get a particular view of the world, I'm going to say, okay, let's pretend I have a camera and I have it at a particular location and it's going to point at a particular location um, in the map. So similar to real photography, this will determine the final view that we end up seeing in the game. And there's a really great um, YouTube video called The Challenge of Cameras, which I'm not going to show in class. Um, it's like a 15-minute video and it talks about uh, from a game design perspective, how important cameras are for showing off the action in your game and for trying to create a sense of um, narrative or a sense of action, etc. So this is all about 3D games, so we won't be going into that here, but go give this, uh, this particular video a watch. It's, it's really interesting. So I'm not, I'm not going to play it here because I, I don't want to play too many videos in this class. But what it talks about a little bit is how 3D cameras um, work, but it also talks about it from a game design perspective. If we were making a 3D game, we'd be spending a lot of time on cameras and how, and how they work and the math behind, mathematics behind them. But we're, we're going with 2D uh, in this course. 
So in a 3D game, you have an X and a Y and a Z axis. You would have a camera and you would define a point in 3D space where that camera lives. And then you could point that camera at something and give it a particular field of view. Okay, so you can the field of view is basically how much or how wide the view of the camera is. And then you may have different views, like for example here, if we have this rubber duck in our game world and uh, the camera is here, it is actually following around the, the, the rubber duck. And so in 3D games, we can have um, different views of our universe. For example, we could have over on the left here, we see a fixed point camera. So this is kind of like a security camera in a way where the camera is fixed, and but it's pointing at the player object. So this is what that type of camera might look like. Here we have what's called a following camera, where the player object represented by this ball here, the camera is actually like behind the head of the player and it's following them around. So if you've played an MMORPG, for example, um, or a 3D action game, that's probably the most common type of camera. Here we've got a virtual reality camera where we could actually map a, a player's head movements to where the camera is looking at. Or we could have a completely fixed camera like up here where it's just looking at a scene and not moving at all. So there's many different types of camera views that we can have in three dimensions. But believe it or not, there's... I don't want to say just as many, but there are a surprising amount of things that you can do with a camera in a 2D game as well. And in this lecture, we're going to go over a bunch of them and we'll see how we would implement those using SFML. So just like a 3D world, um, we can kind of picture a 2D game camera uh, in the same way. So picture we have our game world down here with like a possibly really huge map. And then we're going to have a camera sitting above the game world looking down at that two dimensional map. And how we define this view here is going to be how we end up um, looking at our game world. So there's many different uses uh, for in-game cameras. So for example here, we just see an example of uh, the camera. It can move, it can track the player, it can zoom out so that you, you notice this chest, for example. So the camera isn't just for looking. It's also you can give hints to the player using the camera and etc. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play this next slide. So we're going to watch this video. And I think the video is actually quite loud. So apolog uh, apologies. I'm going to try and turn it down to a reasonable level. But for some reason, the maker of this video wanted it to be very loud. So I'm going to play this now and try and adjust the volume accordingly. This is about a five minute video. So the music isn't too important here, but I'm going to mute my mic anyway. La, la, la. Mm -hmm. hmm. I got it.
So that was that video and let me just play, let me show the uh, URL for that again. So this will be in the slides. I don't know why this isn't going up. So yeah, please go click on this and, and give that channel uh, or video a like or a subscribe because we want to uh, not just completely leech off their content. Okay. Come on, you can do it. There we go. So SFML views. So how are we going to accomplish this in our, in our assignments and in our project for this course? So a view is essentially a window into another world, right? We have our game world and we have a view of that world and that defines what we can see. In SFML, an SF view, this is the, the type of object that we'll create, is a rectangle representing a 2D camera that you can use to specify which pixels of a game will be drawn to the game window. Okay, so um, you've got a, a large game world, you're going to define an SF view, and inside that view, you're going to have a rectangle representing what subpart of the world that you actually want to be drawn to the screen. Changing a Windows view does not alter the underlying sprite positions. It simply changes where in the window that they are drawn. So by changing the view, we can change what part of our game world is shown to the player. And so that's really interesting. Um, you may have thought if you've never worked with views or cameras before that, for example, um, so so far in assignment one, assignment two, uh, thank you for typing the URL there. Uh, in order to change what you're looking at, maybe we have to like change the position of our Mario sprite, or we have to change the position of the tiles so that they're actually drawn to a different place on the screen. But that's not true. This is the really good thing is that we can separate the position of something in the game world from the position of something on the screen. And so in assignment four, that's something that we'll be looking at. Now assignment three, there was a little bit of camera work because in assignment three, you're going to follow um, the player as you go, but uh, that's not like a big leap of faith. All you have to do is center, um, center Mega Man on the screen. But for this assignment, uh, for assignment four, we're going to be dealing more with different views. So here are some examples of uh, SFML views, and you can go here, um, if I just move my camera for a second, you can go here to this URL uh, to, to actually uh, look at the tutorial that they have. So let's look at some examples. So we have our render window. We've talked about this in, in depth, so we don't need to talk about that. We have our window and we have a view. And this view can, uh, the current view of the window, you can get that from window.getView, or you can set the view of a window with window.setView. And if you use window.setView, then you will have to pass in a view. So for example, um, we can initialize the view to a rectangle located at 100, 100 with a size of 400 by 200. So we can say view.reset and then pass in the coordinates of this rectangle and the size of the rectangle. And the really good thing is that SFML will handle all the rescaling for us. If we were going to do this manually by hand, like in OpenGL, for example, we may have to do a lot of the matrix multiplication and, st and stuff ourselves, and that's not something that we want to be doing in this course. Um, it's not a graphics course, it's a game programming course. So we want something that does this for us. But we're still going to have to manually position the rectangle, but all of the graphics stuff about like zooming in or zooming out is going to be handled for us. And then we can do something like, hey, let's rotate the view by 45 degrees. Or we might want to set the target viewport to be half of the window. And I'll talk about viewports in a minute. Um, and then we can apply it. So once we've set up the view, we can actually set the view of the window with window.setView, and then we pass in the view as the argument. Then uh, we can render some things. And if we want to, we can go back to the default view of the window if we want by setting the view of the window to window.getDefaultView. And then what we can do is maybe if we want to draw some text that's not affected by the transformation, then we can do that um, after we set the default view. So what that means, for example, is let's say we want to have some status bar or something that's showing our health on the screen and we always want the health to be drawn in a specific location on the screen, regardless of where we are looking in the map. So what we could do there is draw the map of the screen after we've set um, the view that we want for the map, 
then reset the view to the default and then draw it at like position 100, 100. And then the text will be um, in a fixed position in the window, but the game world will be moving underneath it. So that's just one example here. And they go into more detail about that in the uh, tutorial um, section of the SFML website. There's this really excellent um, article here that uh, is called The Theory and Practice of Cameras in Side Scrollers. And I recommend reading this article for your project. I have borrowed some of the, um, the GIFs that they made on this for this lecture slide. So please um, go visit that website. So the default view of a window, if we remember back to assignment two, which seems like ages ago now, at least to me, um, what we had was a window that was a specific size, and that window encapsulated the entire game world, right? So our entire game world was living within this window. And not only that, but the position of an entity in our game world was also perfectly aligned with the pixel position of our game window. So for example, um, wherever this uh, pentagon, for example, lived in the game world is also the position of that pentagon within the game window. But that's a quite limiting view of, of game programming. And so we want to get away from that and these views will help us do that. But um, by default, the default view of the window, let's say that our window here was uh, 1280 by 720. So that's the number of pixels. So 1280 pixels wide by 720 pixels high. If that is the, um, the dimension of our window, then the default view will be showing from 00, 0 to 1280, 720 in our actual game world as well. So the default view maps one to one, pixel for pixel, the position in the game world to the position on the screen. So this is the SFML, they call it the default view. By default, the window is constructed with that view the top left is 0, 0, and the bottom right is width height. And the view won't move unless we tell it to. So the entire game world must fit into those window dimensions. And it works well for certain arcade style games or board games, but it's very limited when it, when it comes to implementing more complex game mechanics. So for example, this Geometry Wars game, perfect example of where a default view is all we need. Or if we think about a game like Donkey Kong or Pac-Man or old arcade games like Asteroid, Centipede, where the entire game world lived on one screen, that is, um, that's when we would want to use the default view. Okay. So let's talk about, um, we'll go into a little bit more detail than that previous video about different camera types and how we might uh, be able to implement them using the SFML view system. So the first one is pretty much the simplest beyond just, so the default view is the simplest view, right? It, it, it's just fixed, it never moves. And so by definition, this is the, the simplest possible view. Probably the next easiest view to implement is called a position lock. We saw this in the video earlier, but in a position lock, the camera is centered on the player's position or some interesting part of the game world. So it's, it's best in games that have smooth motion. If you have really jerky motion of a player, you don't want to implement position lock. And it's also best when the character is very small in comparison to the map view. So for example, if we were really zoomed in on this car here, then this view, this position lock type of view wouldn't be very good because we wouldn't be able to see enough of the map and everything would be moving by so fast it might even give you like motion sickness. So whenever we're talking about these different types of view, we can also talk about things like camera smoothing. So any of these techniques can employ different camera movement techniques. So for example, uh, if we have auto lock, then the camera would lock instantly onto the target. So this is sort of an auto lock where it's position locked with no camera smoothing. The position of the camera is just the position of, of the entity. Whereas with smoothing, we could implement something where we're trying to follow around the player, but the camera is going to glide to the target. Okay, and I'll show an example of that in a second. And what you should do is, is have a choice of whether or not you implement smoothing based on the game mechanics and what you think the aesthetic of your game should look like. 
for here, so here, for example, we see uh, Terraria. So let me know in the chat if you've ever played Terraria before. But Terraria is, you can think about it as a sort of a 2D Minecraft um, game. So you can dig, you can build, you can make items, you can craft. And in this game, your character is very small with respect to your view of the game. So here um, in the center, you can see the game character. It's quite small in comparison to uh, the overall view that you can see. And so when the character is very small, then if you're following the character along, the relative game changes, um, sorry, the relative XY changes to what's being drawn on the window are such that it's not too fast that you can't notice things, right? So the movement in Terraria isn't super fast and the view is big enough so that this sort of lock on target can work really well. Next, we go to uh, Super Meat Boy. So Super Meat Boy also uh, uses a, um, a camera that is wanting to be focused on the player, but it implements some camera smoothing, okay? And actually this is a form of steering, and we'll get to steering a bit later um, in the course. But here we can see that if we leave the character alone, then the camera centers on the target, but when the character moves, the camera sorts of sort of lags behind, okay? Um, so this just adds a little bit of nice smoothing to the camera, which depending on how your um, game mechanics work. So for example, there's a lot of really fast movement in Super Meat Boy, and there's a lot of back and forth as well. And so if you had it just really locked on the target and with no smoothing, the game might, might be very difficult to play. Okay. Um, the next type of view is called a horizontal scroll view. So can anyone tell me the name of this game? It's a very old arcade game. Um, type it in the chat if you know it. But in a horizontal scroll view, you're going to follow the player in the x-axis only, okay? So uh, this can lead to really jerky motions in left and right. And it's really only useful when your view does not go higher than, say, one screen, right? So this game, uh, no one typed it, but it's called Kung Fu. And in this game, you're basically walking from left to right in a Mario-style manner. Is it karate? I thought it was Kung Fu. I think it's Kung Fu. Um... So this is the, the Mario type of thing where your game world is the same height as your game view and you're only moving back and forth in the X and Y direction. So it works well for certain types of games, but it may not work well for other types of games. So just be careful of that. Um, this sort of following, so this, um, this type of camera that follows you and scrolls doesn't have to be relegated just to XY movement. It could be in uh, horizontal movement or it could be on arbitrary lines as well. So this here um, is from Wonder Boy, which is an old Sega title. And in this game, in this part of the world, um, you're, you're going down a mountainside and so you've got this diagonal view that you're scrolling instead of just a horizontal view. So you could have um, these sort of scrolling follow views that are not necessarily just in um, in one axis. Here we've got a sort of uh, 2.5D game where the game character lives in a 3D world, but the camera is following in sort of this 2D manner. Next we have probably one of the more popular and useful types of game views, which is a box or a trap view. So we saw this in the video as well. What we're going to do with this type of view is draw a box in the center of the screen or around the player somehow. And in this type of uh, system, the view only moves if the player is trying to leave the box. And so it's really useful for action type platforming games with jerky back and forth motion. So down here, I think this is like a Golden Axe clone or it might even be Golden Axe, where uh, you can see here that the player is trying to move back and forth a lot in the game in order to dodge missiles and stuff. I can't remember the name of this game up here. Um, but in both of these games, they're using the box or the trap view in order so that when you move back and forth jittery, the camera isn't moving for every little tiny movement. And this ends up creating a really, um, it's really great for a bunch of different types of gameplay. And on the project, you're going to have to have, um, a bunch of different views. And one of them is going to have to be a box view. 
And this is uh, Fez, I think it's called. Um, so this is uh, another game, which is it's it things live in a 3D world, but you do all of your movement in a in a 2D plane. And so in this game, you can um, change the the rotation of the game world, but you can move in two di two dimensions only once you've changed the view. And there's a lot of interesting game mechanics that come out of this, but it's got this kind of um, box type view combined with something called platform locking, which we'll talk in a bit. But you can see how this ends up affecting the gameplay. We've also got something called position snapping. So in position snapping, what happens is that it follows the character in one axis. So here, for example, in this game, we're following the character always. It's locked on in the X direction, okay? So it snaps the position if the character um, changes position in other axes and it has smoother camera movement overall. So in this one, we've got snap positioning on the X axis, but we've got follow smoothing in the Y axis. So see how this works? So this line here is underneath the player's feet. But if the player jumps or if the player drops down, this is going to slowly catch up to the player in the X or Y axis in opposed, uh, as opposed to the X axis, which is just following all the time. And if you've got platformers with some um, horizontal and vertical movement, this is a decent camera to implement for that in order to smooth out the overall horizontal movement or sorry, the, the overall vertical movement. We've also got something called platform snapping. So this is kind of like position snapping, but instead of, for example, in position snapping, as soon as you move, the position tries to catch up. So it's, it's moving as soon as you do. But in platform snapping, so for example, Super Mario World for the Super Nintendo, um, once you've... Uh, hit the, on a platform, that's when the snapping happens. So in this game, we're following in the X direction. We've got a little bit of horizontal boxing happening, but we've got platform snapping happening in the Y direction. So here you can see that um, this white line is where Mario's feet, um, where the camera wants to position Mario's feet. But if you jump, it won't follow right away. It will use this sort of visual break of you hitting a platform in order to move the camera up. And as such, it's got a really nice feel to it. Um, so again, uh, platform snapping, but this can also appear on level geometry, okay? So, uh, so I already said that, but um, if you've got platforms here um, or slopes in your game, oh, what's this, Rayman? So in Rayman, you've got smooth slopes that can go up or down. And what happens is in Rayman, while you're walking on a surface, that's when the snapping is happening. So not just on jumping, but also when you walk up a surface, um, this platform snapping is happening as well. And it creates a really interesting um, effect. Next, you've got something called camera zones. So camera zones, can you can define different zones on the map, which could... Um, which define how the camera moves. So for example, you can speed up or stop based on the movement of the player and their location within this zone. So let's look at what's happening here in Super Mario Brothers. So this is not what's happening in your assignment, but in the actual game of Super Mario Brothers, they do have this camera zone with accelerated camera movement being implemented. So the first line here, this line says essentially that if Mario is at that position in the X direction, then the camera should be snapping right to Mario. But in order to implement some sort of smooth camera moving, if Mario is actually to the left of this line, when he starts moving to the right, um, or sorry, when Mario gets to this line from the left, that's when the camera actually starts to move. So you can see that effect, right? So when Mario's to the left, the camera's not moving, but when Mario runs to the right and crosses the first line, the camera starts to accelerate, and then it's at a constant speed once it once it reaches this line. Yeah, so this is sort of, as someone said in the chat, it's sort of a, an alternative to the box, but this is dramatically different in the way it works because it, it has accelerating camera based on one line and a, and a uh, follow camera based on another line. So it's not just the box. Uh, 
The camera zones could be less complicated as well. So for example, here in Metroid, we've got camera zones in both the X and the Y direction. Um, and so in some parts, you're only moving horizontally, so you don't want to follow the player horizontally. And in some parts, you're only moving horizontally, so you don't want it to follow the player vertically. So you might have horizontal camera zones, and you may have vertical camera zones to accomplish all sorts of different looks in your game. Super Mario World, uh, on its horizontal level, actually combines two different camera zones. So if you've come from the left, it uses this camera line the the first line to start the acceleration and if you're on the if you're if you're coming from the left and you've reached the second line it's going to follow you there now this these two lines defined all of the camera zones for super mario brothers 1 because in super mario brothers 1 you couldn't move back to the left right you could only go to the right but now what it does is if you reach an area where you're to the right of this line, maybe because there's a pipe or something blocking you or the end of the level, if you start to move to the left, then you've got two more camera zones that will define that type of movement. And again, we could have camera zones that implement things like forward looking ahead. So here we've got an old uh, arcade game and this is, oh my god, what is this game called? Type the name of the game if you forget it, if, if you remember it. My uncle actually has this arcade machine in his house. No, it's not Cave Story. Defender. It might be Defender. It might be called Defender. I can't remember, though. Probably Defender. And so we have these, um, these zones, and you can see up here a little arrow. So that means when you're moving to the left, your player is going to be locked to this line, and when you're moving to the right, the player is going to be locked to this line. And when they're in between, you can see here when it changes back and forth, um, that's when the camera uh, moves. Uh, sorry, uh, has a smooth mo motion to get you from one line to the other. And similarly in this game over here. Also, another thing that you can do is have camera zooming or camera focus. So by moving the camera, so say, let's say in this game here, for example, you're swimming, you're swimming, and the camera is trying to be locked to the center of the screen, but here you've got different areas of focus, and you saw as it came to this really important game object, the camera actually started to move toward the game object. And you can do this as sort of a way to um, change the focus of your player's vision in order to make them aware of certain things, maybe chests or checkpoints or something like that. You can also have a camera window. So uh, in 2D fighting games, camera windows are used almost exclusively. So camera windows can shrink and grow as the players get uh, closer together or further apart. And it's very useful for games like fighting games, or that's what would be like, not light, where both players must appear visible, uh, be visible at all times. So for example, if both players are really close together in a fighting game, like if you've ever played Smash Brothers, for example, I know that there's a few Smash players out there. When the two players are closer together, the camera zooms in a little bit. But when the two players get farther apart, the camera zooms out. But it's very important that the players stay within the view of the camera because both players, you know, if one person's outside the camera and one person's inside the camera, then the person who's inside the camera has a huge advantage. Okay. Next, we have different effects that you could have. Like, for example, we can have camera shake. So back, uh, back here, we have like the very first Mario game here. Where, uh, where, well, where Mario was actually called Mario instead of Jumpman. But here we have, when you hit the POW, the whole screen shakes. And so you can, you can think about how you might implement that, right? Here there's a screen shake in the Y direction, so maybe we're just increasing the Y value of the camera in some smooth sine wave or something like that. And here we've got another game, and I can't remember the name of this game. But we've also got camera shake when things like enemies die or large enemies are walking around the map. So camera shake can add cool effects as well. So what about assignment four? We've got a different type of camera system, which, uh, so here, for example, you have a map, and this is showing um, just a subsection of the world of The Legend of Zelda. So the original Legend of Zelda for the, um, for the NES, it has a huge game world, well, at least for the NES it was huge, which comprises of a bunch of different rooms. And so what Zelda ended up doing, due to limitations in hardware, etc., 
was that you can only be in one room. Um, well, your player, it, it divides the, the map up into a grid. These grids are called, well, I'm going to call them rooms. And these rooms, um, your camera is fixed to show the entire room that you're currently in. So for example, I've just highlighted in red here one of these rooms. Um, so you could be in this room, your player could be here in the, the, at the laser pointer, or it might be over here at this room, right? And so when your player is in that room, in the original Legend of Zelda, uh, you, the camera should be fixed at that room to show the entire room. But within that room, the camera doesn't move. And so your player can walk around freely in that room without the camera moving, but um, but you're not going to actually follow the, the player until it goes to the next room where you'll change the view of the room. And of course, that room could be any size that you want. It's just that when The Legend of Zelda was being um, written, you know, the game designers decided that it wanted this size for a room instead of that size for a room. And so in SFML, if we have a game, a game world that's really large, all we have to do, it's really, really easy. We just define the sub-rectangle of the game world that we want to see, and the camera stuff is taken for us. So let's just have a look at how we would actually do that for our assignment. So a view can be constructed in two ways. It can be constructed with a rectangle, or it can be constructed with a top left corner and a width and a height. So these are kind of the same thing. Okay, so the float rect here defines a top left, a top, um, so the left x component, the top y component, the width and the height. So this is a pretty standard representation for a rectangle. We've been using it throughout the course. Or you could pass in two vector two f's. The first one would be the top left corner. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm incorrect in that. They're not the same. Um, if you use the two vector two f's, um, constructor, then the first one is the center of the window, and the second one is the width and the height. My apologies. So in the first one, you define the rectangle. So here, let me have the pen. So in the first one, you're defining this point, right? That's the top left, uh, the, the left X and the top Y, and you're defining the width and the height. In the second one here, you're passing in the center position of the view, and the width and the height. And so if you wanted to say center link on the map while you're playing Zelda, it might make sense to use this call because it's a little easier to implement. So this means that the same resulting view can be accomplished in multiple ways. So for example, I can do the same view from both of these by these two calls. So let's say I wanted to have a specific view which is at x, y in the top left and has a given width and height. If I want to do that with the second call, then I would pass in the first vector 2f as x plus width over 2, y plus height over 2, which would get me the center point and then width and height. Okay, so that's pretty, pretty easy. And so using the top left way of doing it or the center way of doing it may be more convenient based on the game that you're making but of course um, either one can be accomplished uh, sorry any type of view that you want can be accomplished with either one it just may work out a little nicer for you so in our game world for our assignment four we're going to be defining these rectangles um, as rooms and they're going to have an xy position and a width and a height so those are our rooms and so, for example, uh, in, our, in our game window, we're going to be specifying uh, the x, y as the top left coordinate on our game window and the width and height of the window as our view. And so the center x and center y here would just be x plus width over 2 and y plus height over 2. So if we want to set a view, it can be set in a number of ways, and we looked a bit... A, we looked at this a bit before in the uh, tutorial slide, but views can be set after the window is constructed as well. So we can say, okay, view.reset, and we can pass in a float rect, or we can say view.setCenter, and we can pass in a center X and a center Y. If we say set center, then what's going to happen is the width and the height of the view are going to remain the same. However, we're just going to be setting the center differently. So this can be seen, you can, you can move the view, you're not resizing the view. 
If you say set size, then what this does is you set the width and the height of the view, but you don't change the center. So if you set this, the width to be bigger, this has the effect of zooming out. And if you set the width or the height to be smaller, then this has the effect of zooming in, but it will keep the same center when you're programming. The views, if you, let's say you wanted to scroll um, the screen across, right? So instead of saying uh, set center and then getting the center and adding one, you can just say view.move. So your delta X and your delta Y here. So if you say view.move, then um, your new view rectangle position becomes X plus DX and Y plus DY. And if you want to, instead of setting, saying set size to zoom in and out, you can actually zoom in and out with a variable. So if you say view.zoom with a zoom parameter, if Z is less than one, then it gets closer. And if Z is greater than one, then it gets farther away. And what you're doing here with the zoom is you're just multiplying the width or the height of your set size by Z, okay? So one would be the default and less than one, uh, you zoom in and greater than one, you zoom out. All right, you can also rotate the view of, if you want to create some sort of special effect. Like let's say when Link dies, you want it to sort of spiral inwards and zoom. You can really easily do that as well. So you can say view.rotate angle. And the interesting thing here is that the controls would be the same, but only the view of the game world would change. So for example, in this case, if I rotated the view, if I hit right, I would, I'm still moving right inside the game world, right? So the game world is still this rectangle. Um, but what I've done is now I've rotated my view in the rectangle. So if I have link right here, if I say move right, then he's still going to move to the right like this, but that view has been rotated. So the, the movement will look skewed when I'm actually look at it, looking at it on the screen. And so that's what the view does is it does not affect the controls, but you can sort of have it mimic an effect of the controls by doing that. So if you want to say, for example, I don't know, implement something where your character is intoxicated and the view is moving around or zooming in and out, you can do that really easily um, with uh, view rotations and view zoom. So we just talked about views. Now we're going to talk about viewports. So they both have the word view in them. So it's a little bit hard to, to, to tell the difference, but there's a big, big difference. And we'll discuss that now. So a view defines which part of the game world will be drawn to the window. So a view, remember, that's which part of the world we want to see. A viewport, on the other hand, defines where on the window the view will be drawn to. So if we want to define a viewport, we can say something like draw the view to the left hand side of the screen or draw it to the top left corner or draw it to the whole screen. And so by default, the contents of the view occupy the entire window. So we can define a viewport really easily but they're not defined in pixels in SFML. They're defined as a ratio of the window size. So the viewport is set as a part of a view. So we can say view.setViewport SF float rect XYWH. But in this XYWH, the X and Y is the ratio of the window for the top left portion of the rendering and the W and H are the, rent, the ratios of the window size for the rendering. And when I show an image of this, it'll be very easy what I mean. So here I've said set viewport 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. So what this means is the first 0 0.25 says start drawing the view one quarter of the way in the X direction. Okay, 0 0.25. The next one here is start drawing the view one quarter of the way in the Y direction. Then we have the width and the height in terms of the ratio of the screen. So this says, I want my viewport to be drawing the view in the next half of the screen. 
Okay, so this is 0.5, so it's the half the screen width, and I want to draw it half the screen height. Okay, so we have a view, and whether wherever we draw that view, so the viewport doesn't change what is being displayed, it changes where it's being displayed. All right, so if I wanted this to cover the whole screen, what I would have instead done is say 0, 0, 1, 1. Okay, because then it would start drawing at 0% of the way across the screen in both X and Y, and it would have the entire width and the entire height. So by default, the default viewport is 0, 0, 1, 1. And you can see here how you would, how would use those, ang those variables in order to change the viewport and possibly create some cool special effects. So viewport usage, why would you ever want to do this? Well, it, it's really cool actually because you can use it to create interesting or useful views for gameplay mechanics or multiplayer or mini maps or whatever. So for example, if you wanted a two player split screen, what you could do, um, do I have a view of this? Yeah, so if I define the left player to be 0, 0, um, 0 0.51, then that would be like this. So it would start at 0, 0. It would be drawing one half of the screen width, but the full screen height. Right? Now I go back, and the second player's viewport would be at 0 0.50, 0, 0 0.51. And what that means is you're starting half the way over in the x direction, and 0 in the y direction, and you're drawing for half the screen width, and the full screen height. And so then, from with each inside each of these views, if you centered the first view on the first player and you center the second view on the second player, you've got split screen local multiplayer for free in your video game. How cool is that? It's like 10 lines of code. Really super easy. Um, or what you could do if you're making StarCraft, for example, you can create a mini-map. So what we can do is have uh, two different views. So before we had a player one view and a player two view for, for split screen. Maybe now we have a full game view and we have a mini map view. And so what we could do is set the game view to draw on the entire screen and then set the mini map view to occupy like the bottom corner of one of the screens. So here we've said 0 0.75 in the X direction um, 0 in the y direction and 0.25 in each of the screens. So what this said is it was 0 0.75 So it's drawn three quarters of the way across in the x direction and It's one quarter the the height of the or the width of the screen and one quarter the height of the screen And we can center that wherever we want and so for free almost a couple of lines of code we've got two different views and maybe this one shows the entire world map, and this one just shows where you currently are in the world, right? And so we've got split screen views almost magically for free, which is which is awesome. So we could also do things um, instead of an in-game minimap, we could do something like a rear view mirror. Um, so if you're playing some sort of racing game, something you could show maybe what's behind you or enemies behind you, or it's real. Uh, there's so many cool things. Like now that we know ECS, we can think of insane game mechanics that I've never seen before in a game. Like for example, I could have a gun that shoots cameras at enemies and attaches views to enemies. So like I could shoot a camera at an enemy, and if it hits it, now there's a split screen view where we're centering one of the cameras on those enemies. Like, it's crazy how, how powerful this is when we combine views, viewports, and ECS. It's, it's really neat. So how would we implement these camera types, okay? So there's two main ways that we could implement cameras in our, in our current system. Um, one, would be to implement the camera types inside an ECS system, and then we're gonna have like an enum to switch between the camera types. And, or we could implement a camera class that is passed um, via reference to the game engine or something. So if you have something that's really complex in 3D, maybe you would want to have um, a camera class, 
and so that you could like take care of everything inside the camera class and handle like mouse movements for changing the camera or whatever. But what we're going to do in this class is we're just going to do the first one here. We're now inside uh, in assignment four, we're going to have an S camera function. So we're going to have a system for how we actually move the camera. So one of these things, uh, these ways, uh, what I just described would be we could have a namespace where we define all the different types of cameras. So for example, we could have a follow X, follow XY, a box type of camera, a Zelda camera. And then in our system, in our camera system, we could say if the current camera type is equal to this type of camera, then implement the logic for that. If it's equal to another type of camera, implement the logic for that. And so that's what we're going to be doing for assignment four in order to keep with the tradition of sort of this pure ECS framework. Or what you could do is you could create a camera class which has like a reference to the game engine and has the camera type and then we could have an update function inside the camera class and then we call camera.update on every frame and this would be more of the object oriented programming way of doing it. So what we're going to do is we're going to do it this way with sort of the ECS systems way in assignment four. Okay, one of the last things that I want to show you here is another video um, and don't leave because I have some more stuff to say after the video, but in the project, I want you to implement 2D parallax. Okay, so at least one of your levels um, or one part of your game has to have some sort of parallax effect. So one thing that's really missing from 2D games is this notion of depth, right? Because it's a 2D game, so there's no actual three-dimensional depth happening in your views. But as you're going to see from this video on Parallax, which is about 10 minutes long, um, that it can accomplish some really, really cool stuff. So let's have a look at this video. Um, and my PowerPoint has stopped working properly. So let me open that again. And then we'll look at this actually will this just work if i play it i think it will so let's watch this video here and learn about parallax hi yeah it's me dan i'm an animator and this is video game animation study and we're looking at a slightly different topic this time parallax it's not explicitly animation, but it's a visually moving aspect of games that I'd argue greatly enhances the experience and makes games seem a lot prettier. So let's take a little look at the beauty of parallax in games. So what is parallax? Parallax in games, called parallax scrolling, is where the background moves at a slower pace than the foreground, giving the illusion of depth. You might notice this in real life if you're staring off into the distance on a bus or train and you're staring at the same hill for ages even though you're moving at like 60 miles an hour. It's the same in video games, and the speed in which the background moves affects how far away it seems. A quick and vague history lesson then. Actual background scrolling was a thing golden age cartoons began doing, using large rigs with layers of glass and a camera, particularly in scenes with sweeping panoramas. Obviously not every cartoon did this, but those that did look just that bit more gorgeous. Video games properly started dropping in parallax scrolling around the third generation, thereabouts, but it tended to use a lot of memory so as either basic or limited, though it wasn't absent completely, and there were tricks around it. Platform games in particular tended to use flat static backgrounds, so when a game had parallax scrolling it looked bloody awesome. Parallax became common from the 16-bit era onwards, and it was fairly uncommon to see a flat looking platform game. Even top down adventure games used it in interesting ways to signify a vast cliff edge or a drop. Some platform games in the 32 bit era still used basic one or two layer scrolling backgrounds, but as time and hardware have progressed, so have technical capabilities, making parallax scrolling an almost natural aspect of many 2D games, practically a non issue in 3D games, and usually being omitted or restricted in modern games as an aesthetic choice. So what does Parallax do? Well, as mentioned before, it helps convey a sense of depth, and using more layers of Parallax will push that perception of depth further. 
Why add visual depth to a game? Depth helps convey a believable sense of space for your character to explore, and this in turn contributes to the immersiveness of gameplay, and thus your enjoyment as a player and consumer. That's not to say that games without parallax offer any less depth in terms of immersiveness or your enjoyment as a player. On the rare occasion, parallax can be handled in perhaps not the best way, and it can be disorienting and distracting. Okay, so let's have a look at some examples and study them. Donut Plains, Labyrinth Zone and Norfair. These all have one layer of parallax, which is fine. If you care a little more about immersiveness, then these might come across as just big flat walls some way back from the stage platform. It's simple, but creates a sense of space which would otherwise be missing on a completely flat looking screen. Games like Kirby's Adventure and Bucky O'Hare on the NES are some of the earlier examples of platform games having relatively accomplished parallax scrolling of two, three, or even more layers. This is beginning to feel a lot more like the background is further away, with each layer seemingly an equal distance apart, almost extruding the playable area back into the game. Now, I know a lot of people are fed up with it, but Green Hill is one of my favourite stages in any game and it's because it has a believable space. There's two layers of hills in the background, a couple layers of clouds, but it's the lake that really lifts this believability. It has this almost faux 3D effect that stretches from the base of the nearest hill right up close to the stage platform. It helps that the water is animated too. Those waterfalls in the background match the ones you walk over, making it easy to imagine that what is right here is also far over there. See, if we compare what Green Hill could look like with a flat background to the much deeper background, there's a greater sense of space that can be explored beyond what you actually can, and this is missing when there's only one moving layer. Ok, so how about vertical scrolling? Shinobi 3 for the Mega Drive has this great section where you're falling down this canyon, and the sides seem to stretch right back to the edges in the distance, and it really feels like you're in this thin crevice in a mountain. This is the sort of effect I think would work in places like Norfair, particularly down the main shaft. It'd add to that depiction of a cavernous lava pit. An earlier stage in Shinobi has a similar effect when going up as well. In fact, Shinobi 3 manages parallax scrolling really well, putting it to good use in boss fights and other sections to let subtle storytelling elements play out in the background, something which wouldn't feel the same were the background to be flat. I think if we compare this to maybe Streets of Rage, you can kind of see the difference I'm talking about. A particular favourite example of mine is this part in Symphony of the Night. When you first enter, the background looks a bit of a flat mess, but when you start walking past it, man it just comes alive with depth, quite literally when you see a creepy huge eye staring at you from the distance. Ok, so how could we project depth forwards as well as backwards? Muramasa Demon Blade, as well as having many layers of parallax going back, also has a few foreground elements which move faster than the stage platform, appearing in front of where you're playing, giving the impression of being closer. Sonic games have been pretty good in extruding the depth forwards as well as backwards, like in Starlight Zone. Donkey Kong Country has bananas in battle arenas that seemed closer than in other stages. You don't necessarily always need something literally close to the screen, you can have a few layers to make it seem like, say, the ground is stretching right up to the screen, like here in Wonder Boy the Dragon Strap. And this is another particularly good example. When we begin to look at all of this together, what you have is a real set piece for immersiveness, and throw in animated elements to these scrolling layers, and wham, you've got a dynamic environment. Now, are there examples of parallax being handled either badly, weirdly, or even just lazily? One thing that's always going to come across as disorientating is when a background is static. From a logical sense, it should mean that the thing is infinitely far away, that any movement our end won't result in any movement of the background, like a night sky for example. 
Sometimes it technically makes sense, like in Death Egg Zone here, but it often results in it looking a bit strange. Having a static back layer after many other layers is fine, because it almost draws your eye to the back and it's a bit more believable. But static on its own, that's confusing. It doesn't even have to be static in both directions. Sometimes it'll look fine from side to side, but it won't scroll up and down. And that can also have a bit of a disorientating effect. Okay, so this one from Jim Power, The Lost Dimension for the Super NES, is particularly strange if you're not sure what's going on. As we can see, the furthest background layer is moving the fastest in the opposite direction, with these middle layers moving slowest. That is literally the opposite of what we've experienced so far. So what's this about? Instead of our imaginary box of layers with a camera at the front, what's happening here is we actually have a cylinder, and we're looking at the closest edge as the main platform with the opposite side of the cylinder as the furthest layer of the background, and the centre of the cylinder are the middle layers, and the camera is rotating around the centre. It's a neat idea, but it's a difficult thing to make sense of visually if you're not quite sure of the context. A similar idea is used in the Metal Sonic boss fight in Sonic Mania. I do apologise for all the Sonic footage, but honestly these guys seem to understand it really well most of the time. It seems to make a bit more sense in this case because as you're running with Metal Sonic you're kind of going around this big pillar thing, so you are literally running around it with the background moving the opposite direction. That makes sense. I'd definitely like to see more of this type of parallax scrolling. This fight against Vault Kraken tries this little idea, almost using the inverted vertical scrolling, but it doesn't quite work, but I would like to see this tried out. Also I have no idea what's going on with these bushes in Aquatic Ruin Zone. It's like they're moving at a completely different speed, but you go through them, I, I, I don't know. Okay so that's that from me. Uh, there are plenty of examples I didn't cover. There are so many lovely examples out there. Do feel free to comment your own for others to seek out and enjoy. Alright, so that was that video. Let me uh, hit escape here. So please go send some love to this YouTube channel. Let me uh, copy and paste this. Uh, I'll have to exit here copy link. So here's the, the link to that YouTube. Please go, please go give them a, a, a subscribe or something. They, they do excellent, excellent YouTube videos about game programming and design. Um, let me go back to the programming screen here for a second, because what I want to do real quick is I want to open up assignment four and show you what we'll be doing now that you have the context of these views. So, um, so this is the assignment four solution here. No, it's not. Here we go. So this is the assignment for solution. Uh, I've got some, there's actual music in the game now, so uh, I'll do that. So here we've got uh, Legend of Zelda, and I'm walking around as Link in this clone of the original Le Legend of Zelda that we've made. And in this game, um, the game map is actually defined, we have a huge world. Um, we're going to have two different views that we implement and the first one is the traditional Legend of Zelda room view So if I go up here off the top of the map, then I'll change the view to the room that's up here If I come back down and I go to the left, I'll get this room view and if I come down here and I like kill this enemy And go down here to this then I'll get this room view, okay? So we'll be implementing that sort of room view, but also if I hit a button, ah crap, I haven't implemented that button yet, but we'll also be able to toggle off centering the camera on Link. And it's actually really strange to see uh, Legend of Zelda being played when the, when the camera is actually centered on Link. So um, we'll be doing that, and that's just the context of what you'll need for assignment four. Um, so yeah, that's... Uh, that's pretty much it for this lecture. That was uh, what I wanted to cover on cameras and views and viewports. So uh, thanks for tuning into that, and I'll see you on Thursday.